Rusty Pickups are a four-piece ensemble from Queensland's Darling Downs who released the EP Rattle In My Heart last year. Earlier this year, they played quite a few shows at the Tamworth Country Music Festival and they've since released two singles, Goddamn Sunday and Mr Mary Reed. Michael Cook is here to talk about it. He may be accompanied audibly by... Some animals? Yes, we just I uh, we were just visiting um one of my kids' friends' families and uh, got back in time, uh, but they spied me running from the house to the studio here and and I yes I entered the room to the braying of donkeys, the bleeding of sheep, and I don't know the, the rather scarily human esque noise that comes out of goats. I don't know how to describe it yet, but they do. They just sound like a very disgruntled human sometimes, and it is I was like that could be a bit off putting to have in the background. Uh, are the goats a new addition? They are actually. Yeah, that was. Um, I, I'd been away a bit. We had our. Um, I was away for work from home, and then got back just in time. We had our uh, tour to Sydney, um, our first tour down there, which was wonderful. And then I, I got back, and um, I actually had to have some minor surgery done. And, and we just finished that. And my wife said, "Look, this animal thing's getting a bit much. Like I'm having to do too much." And oh. you know, this wasn't what it was. But and I was like, "No, you you bang on. You're right. This is this is supposed to be a me thing, and we 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 need to rebalance things and make sure that you know we don't get too excited." However, there are four goats turning up tomorrow, so I need to help you build a fence. <laughs> Luckily, she loves the goats. I, I within a week, she'd sent me video footage of her reading poetry to the goats with a cup of tea. So it was that was one of the long shots that paid off, I think. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if the goats can possibly help with the other management because they eat a lot. They'll eat anything. They do. So, you know. And yet, and yet they um as far as what you need to feed them for them to be happy and healthy, it's they're they're definitely the most cost effective animal on the farm, that's for sure. They're they're dangerously close to not being a a financial burden, which every other animal here is not pulling its weight. Let me give you the scoop. Well, there you go. So you therefore your wife can't object to the goats at all. Just a, it's just a series of pets of which one is costing less than the rest. <laughs> It sounds like, like something I should write down. One, the one pet that costs less than the rest. That's a song yeah. lyric waiting to happen. It's like they almost negatively geared the goats. Well, that's it. And if we can get Alba to take care of that as well, then we'll uh, we'll we'll be all sorted. <laughs> so now, have the goats ever, or, or any of the animals ever appeared uh, in your songs? Have they turned up as a chorus or something like well, that? We did. We we put the the donkeys were on the cover of the um, Rattling My Heart EP. That uh, that was said uh, Pearl and Opal. Um, but no, the, the, yes, animals seem to be making a, a bit of a theme. We're, um, the, what you can sort of see behind me, this is our, uh, our studio that we built down at, um, at, down at Murphy's Creek, which was then named Possum Studios on account of the fact that there is just there, that's on my jobs list on the wall here, studio work number one is possum proofing because right. there has been a, a possum move in there and it, it's got to go but I know I knew that it was having a baby so we're just waiting for that situation to resolve itself and then I'll have to take all that insulation out and move it on to a new home so that was um the birth of possum studios and when we recorded um the new tracks here which was so much fun like it was really great um just to be out here uh, in the middle of nowhere and sort of have your own time frame and you're not working on other people's you know when you finish you can leave it in a mess and come back tomorrow but there was when we were doing vocals there was a case of going so we're ready and we're doing this we're right okay great one second and then you'd have to tear over throw a biscuit of hay over to the donkeys and the, and the sheep and just, just shut them up for a bit and then tear back again and but we, I think we got through it all sands any animals the, the only ones that we did have to move on was there was a crow parked up outside that had a couple of rocks thrown at it until it moved on and i love birds don't I? like i love my birds but um it's not the most romantic of bird sound to have in the background that uh it's almost we call it a north queensland laugh that ha ha and it's like yeah i don't want that i don't want that in my track well, so, particularly if Goddamn Sunday was the song you were recording at the time, you know, that's got some space in it, that song. You yeah, don't really possibly. want, you know, the crow yeah. coming in. Yeah. <laughs> Just that, that hideous noise that comes at 2 a.m. On, uh, on Sunday morning when you still haven't woken up to yourself and gone to bed. Yeah. Um, I know that laugh well. It's the neighbourhood crow. So given <laughs> that you have your own studio and, as you said, you know, you can leave things and come back to them the next day, but do, do you then get tempted to do, like, 15 vocal takes because you can it was fun look we're really lucky in the band to have the, the the four of us that we each have sort of roles that we're good at um we were talking about it the other day we, we played at the gas um up near Maribor with hillbilly goats and um andrea Kerwin and carlos williams and a heap of wonderful bands and we realized on the drive home that um we were the only guys that had jobs 
and then everyone else was, you know, they're all professional musicians and we all had to go home because we had work in the morning. And I was like, wow, like, you know, if, if only we'd um, been doing this when we were 20. And I was like, you know what, if we were doing this when we were 20, none of us, well, we would all have been 20 year old idiots for a start. Um, <laughs> and none of us would have had the little individual life experiences and skills that we've got, which meant we probably would have had to pay someone to do that and we would have had to have jobs to pay them because you you know not making money from music so really we're probably not in that different a situation except we're not idiots so you know maybe we're in front and in that um lee does a amazing work uh with with mixing he, he he loves to cut and paste and find the right little tiny pieces and um aiden our double bass player is just a wonderful producer he knows how to to find the right stuff and he knows when you need to do another one and when you don't and um yeah so if you're as useless in that regard as I am, it's it's quite easy just to go, yeah, you just tell me what I need to do. And when you say stop, I'll stop. So it actually worked pretty well. Well, except also the studio is on your premises. So I think that's the, that's what you're bringing to it. It's like, you've got the studio. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's it. There's, there's, little, there's little bonuses to that. As yeah. well. But it's interesting, that question of, you know, you know if you've been 20 year old idiots running around because also the four of you sing and you harmonize and, and there's that richness that comes from those vocals that you probably can only get through lived experience and experience performing, but also life experience because the voice comes from that mysterious place. Yeah. If you've been 20 year olds who are just tearing around having fun, that richness arguably would not have been there. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because that's what we sort of, you know, when you, you, you have kids and you grow up and you you experience real heartache and in, in different parts of your life and stuff. And when you get to a point where you go, all right, well, you know, no one, no one band has the greatest singer, the greatest musician, the greatest songwriter, whatever. All, all you can really aim for is that you, 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 you're honest and truthful about what you're doing. And it always amazes me. I remember um, my wife and I on our honeymoon fell in love with, um, Oh, now I've got, I'm going to forget the name. It was a song that we walked down the aisle to, uh, Connor Oberst, his band Bright Eyes. So that, that the Bright Eyes album with First Day of My Life on it, when it had come out. I remember we just listened to it, driving all around Tasmania and just thinking that just the the rawness and the honesty and how, you know, and then I looked it up to see how old he was and went, no, no one should have that kind of connection with a listener. And that at that age, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't have experienced enough yet. You know, at that age, I knew, you know, nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was writing these songs that, and it, it always, we, we were discussing that not long ago, how every now and then you, you come across a young musician who writes with the, with the honesty and the integrity that, that belays, belies their age and, and makes you think, wow, what did you do to get old head on young shoulders in that situation? You know, and it's, it's a rare thing and it should be celebrated when you do. Well, maybe they just have a good imagination. Perhaps. That is the other thing. Perhaps they're just exceptional liars. That's an option that we had in this <laughs> um, No, I, I was going to, that was going to be a segue about imagination, except that your new single, Mr. Mary Reed, I do believe is rooted in fact. So well, yeah, yeah the, the worst kind. I mean, it, it's such a great story. And, and there's, we've been waiting for the um, historians to pull us up on it. And we sort of tell a story and just keep an eye out for someone who goes, that's not right. But Depending, it, it, there's the full spectrum of um, it's completely made up to, oh, it is absolutely factual and here's exactly what happened of the story of Mary Reed, who, like many stories back then, even up to the, um, uh, I think it was in the Vietnam War, there was women masquerading as men so they could be doctors in the army and, and help soldiers and all these sorts of things. And she was one who masqueraded as a man to be a, a pirate and, and she had a you know, she had a lover. And there's all these incredible stories about all the things that she did, pillaging the coast and um, you know, robbing and embarrassing the aristocracy, which I'm a huge fan of. Um, and we we sort of, it, it was a bit of a spaghetti Western song that I'd written in a, and this is at a weekend intensive that we put together to cut down some songs and decide what we were going to record next. And and Lee was like, oh, I've got this riff that it'd sit really well over that. And that's the riff that kicks off the song. And so we sort of sat there finding this mixture between the, the two songs until we sort of found it. We ran out a day and um, just recorded it on a phone. And um, Waylon came back the next day and went, oh, I had a bit of an idea. And I was like, Man, he, and he's, he's such a poet, honestly. He's an incredible musician, but he just comes up with the best ideas. And he laid this story out. And I'm like, so out of all of these things, out of all, like embarrassing the aristocracy, pillaging the coast, you know, illicit love affairs <laughs> with other women. And we're going to sing about 
the point of view of a bloke on the boat who's looking at who is a male captain and just going, is is he hot though? Like he seems hot. There's just, you know, surely it's not just me that thinks that this <laughs> this Captain Reed is like got something going on, <laughs> which is brilliant. Like I love it, and it's one of my favorite songs to sing because I didn't write the lyrics to it, so I can I can I can happily say it's genius. Like he just did such a great job, and I love it. But yeah. it's um yeah, it's a whole lot of fun. That's for sure. Well, it almost suggests like you could have a, a whole song cycle about Mary Reed because the pillage is that you know all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, oh, it could be a concept album, that's for sure. But I think there's 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 probably a like a line of how far you should take pirate country, and I, I, we've probably done it. <laughs> it's probably time to move on. <laughs> pirate country, I love it. <laughs> Not yes, a songwriter I've heard of thus far. No, but no, I think probably it. until I said it, it's there's probably a reason that no one says it up until then. <laughs> and now we've realised why, that we don't need to really delve deeper into pirate country, perhaps. Well, maybe you do, but I'll leave that with you. <laughs> Stylistically, it is quite different to Goddamn Sunday, which is, it is. intriguing. It's It's got more of a sea shanty feel, whereas Goddamn Sunday is, a, you know, a slower feel. Um, so I'm wondering if you if you like consciously try to differentiate the styles or it's more, well, that's what suits this song and that, and we'll just pursue that. Um, I, yeah. Look, I think it goes full circle again to not being 20. Um, you know, when, when I turned 30 something, I realized that I didn't care that I still love Garth Brooks and I still love country music. And that's, uh, you know, I, I stopped being in loud bands and just said, yeah, I'm just going back to playing country music. It's what I like doing. Cause I don't care. I'm just too old to care anymore. And, <laughs> Then with the band, we sort of wrote all these songs and then we cut them back and we started, you know, building our, our, our set as we wrote more songs and more kind of got put aside for a minute. And then we realised that these songs that, are, that we're putting aside, we love them, you know, and and, and they come from different places. That Lee, Lee is a real died in the world folk. Dave Rawlings is God guy, you know. So if, if that's what we're feeling that day, we can just let him get out in front and charge and follow along and we will find a, a died in the wall Dave Rawlings moment that we get to have and make our own. Um, I write Sad Bastard Country because that's what I do and and um, I write about my, my kids and my farm and my, my wife and my family and and that's where I go. And Aiden is this addicted to old time music. He runs an old time jam in, in Toowoomba now every second Sunday where we pop along and take banjos and double basses and just sit in the park and play, which is wonderful fun. And Waylon's um, played in, you know, big bands and jazz bands and everything. And so everyone's kind of got their own little flavor that they do. And and rather than go, Oh, you know, well, we're trying to do this. So should we maybe, you know, group these ones together and then, and then come back to that one. We just kind of went, you know what, we've got our own studio. We're old. You know, who cares we're just gonna do whatever we want so now we, we just sort of we pick the songs that we want to do and we go how can we best serve this song and and then we try to record that and then you know I do the PR stuff for us now and, and try to reach out to people like you and, and and hope that you like it and it's sort of working I guess I don't yeah. really know <laughs> Well, it is absolutely. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. Um, and so that whole idea of serving the song as well is is really important. And it's but what you were talking about that process of of initially thinking of you know we need to do this, we need to do that. It's that impossible task of trying yeah. to guess what is going to please all the people all of the yeah. time. And there's nothing. Yeah, and instead, being authentic is what's most likely to please. Yeah, and look, and that's it. I mean, we we had a big chat not long ago about um, you know, what 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 are we defining as success mm -hmm. you know my, my goal from the start was always just because i've been in bands and that was okay i organized a little sort of festival for a, a night indoor type deal for our first show and i went okay so i know how much we're gonna money we're gonna make from day one so i just want it that no one ever has to dip into their pocket that's my idea of success and we've four years later we've, we've managed that well we you know we don't have a lot of money or anything like that but we've got a money in the bank to buy some new merchandise which was fun and right. and you know and, and that's that's huge but then that's what we were discussing was okay well uh, it is fun the metric that we need to be focusing on or what are you going to do what what are what what do you focus on to to climb rungs and that's what we came to was musically let's write the songs that we care about. Uh, let's record those songs that we care about as best as we can. And if they fit, great. If they don't, uh, look, there's an album. There's always seven songs in an album that don't really maybe perfectly fit with the rest, with, you know, with the four singles that went out. So let's yeah, yeah. do whatever the hell we want to do. And it's, it's fun. And it's kind of cool because we, 
like last year we played um, uh, the Gimpy Muster and we were like sort of the, almost the hippie folky boys of the Gimpy yeah. Muster and you know, ran our old timey mics and singing harmonies and whatnot. And I think that was either the following weekend or the weekend after we played at Nearham Creek at the festival out there and we were the rednecks there, you know, so we were like, we don't really fit anywhere, but because of that, we kind of also fit everywhere because we can play whatever we like. And it's um, and it's a lot of fun. You get to meet some really cool and interesting people. Well, and you've mentioned fun. I actually had a question about fun. And the question is, what is the most fun thing about being in Rusty Pickups? Oh, I nearly swore. Um, <laughs> oh, look, it's it's all it, it, yeah again we, we're so bizarre because we just had this big discussion about fun not being a metric and maybe fun is the metric or and this we, on our tour to sydney it came up quite a lot as far as because we all come from different places and some of us have you know uh, one of us is essentially a professional musician their life is music teaching music and playing music and that's where their money comes from so their metric of success shouldn't be fun it's got to be paying rent and that sort of stuff and we, we sort of went through that but it's all fun. Like uh, it's, um, you know, when you, you get a bit older, you have kids and stuff and, you know, the amount of friends that used to have all the time drop off, but to have, um, you know, three guys that you really respect as musicians be coworkers essentially in, in an endeavor that is fun when you get to hang out in a studio to the point where you would build a studio at your house to, yeah to make it all work. And you're like, yeah, now you've got to be my friends. Can I come on down? So yeah. you, you get to work together on that. You get to go on the road. Like we're, we're planning. We've pretty much booked out next year now with our, with our plans of what we're doing and getting ready for, for 2026 and thinking about what we might want to achieve there. And it's it's strange to have, after after a couple of years, to still have um, three guys that are great mates that you want to catch up with regardless and um, and have a group chat that's god knows how deep because you're always sharing information about your personal lives and what's right. going on as well and and then at the end of it you get to play music and i mean that's that's the dream well i think sharing information about the personal lives just fodder right like that's the song oh, yeah. out of that someone can look at that and go got it but i also yeah. get the sense that you know and also from what you're saying but i had the sense before that you all just really like entertaining each other and of course what that translates into is entertaining the audience because if you're having fun yes we'll have fun oh that's it and it and it's um yeah it's it's nice when you get to a point where there are like inside jokes that have developed to the point that it's not a rusty pickup show unless unless they happen you know making lee uncomfortable about something or catching aiden out about you know banter on stage that he brings up or um well yeah but there's there's, there's, a, there's a lot and it and it goes deep enough now that you do rarely finish a show where you want at some point to say man i'm really sorry everyone like this this last five minutes was all about us and we kind of forgot you were there <laughs> that's probably not so cool but we're having a great time i hope you're having a little bit of fun but um you weren't supposed to understand any of those jokes because that was really just an us moment. Um, <laughs> if is that poor showmanship? Maybe it is. I don't know, but um, but it is fun. We do, we do have a lot of fun, and it is like the tour to Sydney was incredible hard work. But um, you know, you'd be tired and and getting yourself to the next place and not sure if you were going to sell tickets or what was going to happen. But to be tired and have those moments, and then to get up on stage and play, and and it's just straight back in for, for me especially i i do feel very lucky because i'm not much of a guitarist i can play but i'm not i i'm not going to the blues jams to shred i don't have that in me i i, I boomba chaka boomba chaka boomba chaka and that's it that's my role and that's all i have to do and that's wonderful but i get to watch you know i've got this double bass player sitting over my shoulder and and then lee and bernie and um lee and Wayland, sorry and Wayland's playing piano accordion as much as he plays keys now but to watch you know, he learnt that just so he had an acoustic instrument, which I think is hilarious. All right. Um, and then we make him bring the keyboard anyway. So he still has to carry right. more, but it's, you know, there's times. There, there are a few gigs. I think we took the keyboard to Sydney and back and never got it out once. So oh. it came along. But to watch those two uh, every now and then, it's a, it's a different energy between them. And, and where normally you, you throw eight bars to Lee and he solos and does his thing. The next gig he's doing two and he's throwing it to Wayland and it's going back and forward and back and forward and you get to have those wonderful moments where it's 
almost chaos and um and, and you get to watch it up close and go i can't do any of this and i'm just i'm just loving watching it and i'll just sit in the middle and jangle along that's that's my thing so i, I consider myself lucky in that regard well um, you mentioned chaos so when i interviewed andy gollage a few weeks ago he said that he thinks live music should always have an element of danger and which i thought was such a great concept yep. but that's what i think that's what you're talking about yeah absolutely and with the this sort of new show that we've put together we play around uh, an edwina which is an old-timey um condenser mic and that's yeah that's kind of like just throwing a snake on stage with you because it's it's they're amazing until they're not and then they just go and and you give sound man sound guys heart attacks and everything but so far it's it's happened to us a few times in sound checks that it's just exploded and gone but uh it's never happened during a show but it is always just right there that it could possibly just go horribly wrong at any moment so you really need to make sure you're making a good impression right now yeah right. <laughs> so you played a few shows in the Tamworth Country Music Festival this year it was hot I'm wondering yeah. if that tested your friendships at all if you were still having fun by the end of it honestly by the end of it we were pretty cooked we um we the, the year before um we were offered a support slot with a band on the Wednesday night and I said well okay if we're doing it what are we doing I don't want to just drive down there to play one show. So what are we going to do? And we ended up scoring the the atrium stage, the the little yeah. um, cabin, which is wonderful and it's air conditioned. It uh, the guy who runs it, Mike said, um, "Oh, well, look, I wish you'd got in touch sooner, but if you want, it starts at ten a.m. You can have five shows Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday at nine a.m. Right. So before it even started, I was like, yeah, why not? Why, why, <laughs> what's the worst that can happen? We'll go and catch some people having brekkie." So we played five show, and as it was, the Wednesday night show got cancelled. Oh. So that was the only reason. That was the only shows we were doing was that Monday through Friday, nine a.m. in the morning. And and we said, look, let's just make people wonder why we're playing so damn early. And yeah. and we played five great shows, and it was a whole lot of fun. We didn't even, even plug in most of the time. We just kind of walked around and oh. balladed it, and it was it was great fun. And then so I went right next year. We're going to really get out there and 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 experience everything we can and we'd played a show uh, on the monday night at bears where we camped because their music cancelled and they had a great and they said i'll come back play as much as you want so we ended up doing 13 shows in nine days which i do not recommend and and i think four of them were three hour shows um another couple were two hour shows and then there was the bear shows, the three bear shows, and they were all two hours two and a half hours i think i worked out at the end we played 23 and a half hours over the the time that we were there and as you said it was i think the cool days were 41 um like it was cooking and we were by the time we played our last show at um the where was the last one the welder's dog and it was like it was the latest show we played it was nine o'clock at night and i was like who did this and the answer was me i did this but i'm like who who you know, we, 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 the Saturday and the Sunday, we played midday with Haystack Mountain Hermits in the air conditioned hall and it was beautiful. And then you're like, cool, we could just be going to have a sleep now, but instead we're going to wait nine hours and then play our last show at the Welder's Dog, which is still feels like 45 degrees inside. Mm. And we finished that. And honestly, on the drive home, I just went, yeah. And, and we had some shows in late February and early March and just went, they're not a hundred percent confirmed yet. So I am going to un 100 percent unconfirm them. <laughs> and we'll just have a little break. <laughs> just yeah. just get catch our breath for a bit. And yeah. it turned out to be the best thing we did because we sort of we got back into the studio and we started thinking, what do we want to do different? Which is it's always hard to to see what you want to do that's different to what you're doing if you're still doing the mm-hmm. first one. And that's kind of where we got to. We we played Gimpy and then it was near him and then it was this festival and these gigs and and then all of a sudden it was Tamworth again and we were like we, didn't we just leave here like right. we'd done 36 shows for the year all having full-time jobs and we were back to where we started and and just putting the brakes on was um was really good for us I think all individually and collectively yeah it's um yeah it's great so now we're trying to find if I can learn my lesson and I think I have we've got we've got our Tamworth schedule I'm, I'm just going to check now because I've, I've talked a big show about um about how how restrained I was, but I'm just going to check. So Tamworth the air conditioning is also emerging as a theme here. You need air conditioned venues everywhere. Well, I'm running through. Uh, so Monday aircon, Tuesday aircon, Wednesday no aircon, Thursday aircon, Friday fifty fifty aircon and non aircon, Saturday and Sunday both aircon. So there you go. Mostly air conditioned and definitely not twenty three and a half hours. No three hour shows this year. 
Next well, that year. sounds that sounds excellent. But speaking of cooking, um, as you did, you are going to play the Roma Country Music Festival at the end yes. of the now that is that will be warm, I imagine. That will be proper warm. But um, yeah, and I think Roma, disgusting heat, and Tamworth, disgusting heat are similar beasts. I I, I used my um my sister and brother in law have owned um businesses uh, originally pubs out in Roma for many years. So from when I was fifteen, it was always the staff that they couldn't get at Christmas. It was like, congratulations, you're running the bottle shop. So I remember ringing my brother one day and going, hey, I just heard on the radio that they're sending everyone home from, you know, town because it's hit mm-hmm. 45 degrees. So do you want me to shut up the bottle shop or what? And my brother-in-law was like, no, just get ready to run. And within 15 minutes, there was cars lined up back to oh town God. and it was vile. But yeah, it was, that's what I was there for. So I do have some experience dealing with Roma heat. Um <laughs> I'm concerned about which way they're going to face the stage because I think we're on at like 1.30 in the afternoon. So I'm really hoping that there's some kind of shade provision provided and that we're not going to be in the sun lest, uh, lest yeah. the double bass strings just melt and it, it, will be, it will be proper hot, I'm sure. But wonderful opportunity to, to sort of to get to play that one. And we're, we're doing the um, Queensland Music Trails uh, in November as well. So that's with um, uh, Matt Corby and Angie McMahon and, and a heap of other wonderful artists. Well, I don't know about Queensland Music Trails. Is that sort of like a succession of, of shows? Uh, yeah, so they do, um, uh, this is called The Long Sunset, this one, but they do, the Queensland Music Trails is all about taking acts um, to regional areas. So this one's right. in Canungra, which is not exactly the most regional, but very convenient for us. Um, but they this year they, they've done shows in Birdsville and um, Charleville and, and everywhere that's sort of out, out west. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting one to be a part of. Um, which yeah, which will be not so hot, but it'll be a, a, a sort of step. In the, we're climbing the rungs of of disgusting heat to get us to uh, to Roma, and then no doubt back to Tamworth again. So. <laughs> Well, hopefully, uh, yes, it won't be as bad this year. But because yes, your Tamworth dates are not yet announced, but that's not uncommon at this time of year. A lot of acts wait yep. until a little closer because the guide has to be released. So you mentioned, you know, you've got your own studio, you've done some recording. I'm guessing that there are some other songs that you have recorded ready yes. to roll out at a certain point. Yeah, yeah, we do have. We we are planning on getting back into the studio again. We we never really this time we didn't go great. Let's record an EP. We just went look. There's three songs here that we want to record because we kind of think they could all be singles. And two of them were Mr. Mary Reed and Goddamn Sunday. They were both songs that we really believed in. The third was um, was a song that uh, that I wrote, so a bit of a sad bastard song. Um, and then to, to, to get the piano, uh, on, on the first EP, we were lucky enough to record at the uni where they've got this quarter of a million dollar Steinway grand piano, which nice. if, if you watch the... Um, Actually, the, the goddamn Sunday film clip, oh, yeah. Bernie sitting at it, Wayland sitting at it, uh, where we do the the film clip. And once we saw it, we were like, oh, well, we've got to use it. And then then we, that kind of changed everything. So we're like, yeah, it sounds really good, though. Like, we need to make everything else sound equally good. So this time we went, oh, if you listen carefully, the donkeys have just started braying. You just hear the donkey, yes, yeah. Very upset that it's 5.30 and hasn't been fed. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so the... For when we were recording it, we wanted more of a, a almost a slightly out of tune type deal. So we ended up running um, a cable from the studio here through the bathroom window of the house into the inside upright piano that my daughter, that my kids play on, and um, and recorded it. So you couldn't see Waylon, and we just sort of went with that to get the sound we wanted. And while it was there, there's uh, another song that we've been playing for quite a while. That's um, another piano driven song, and I'm like, look, we're set up. We should lay that one down while we're going and um the the job that Aiden did it was I, I did my vocals and then he was like mate you're done that's I don't need you anymore um <laughs> so I went and hung out with the family for a bit and I came back and they had put together this almost like a doo-wop band backing vocals and it was like at first I'm like that is hilarious and on the second listen I'm like no I love that that's just that's just fantastic so whether we single it or just put up, pop it on an EP, I, d- I don't know. But we've got a couple of new songs that we also really want to record um, that would sort of round it out to an EP. So we're hopeful that we'll, we'll put out another single soon um, and then try to maybe put out a double EP on vinyl or something for, for Tamworth or just to have something to bring along with this would be, would be good. Because if anyone has seen roughly 60 
copies of our EP in Tamworth. That we're pretty sure that's where the box got left. So oh no, we got <laughs> oh, no, no idea. I, I think it's there. We just know that anyone goes, oh, "Have you got a CD?" It was like we we did. Yeah. yeah, we don't. We lost them. They're gone. You can see. Oh, us shame. Well, yes. If yeah. it's vinyl, it's, you're less likely to lose it just because. Oh not, yeah, yeah. I do fret about taking vinyl in Tamworth though, just in case it comes home. Like, remember when you used to turn vinyl into ashtrays when you were at school? Yeah, yeah. I fear that that could happen to all of them. So maybe take an esky as well and just put temperature it- controlled rusty hey. pickups. I love it. There you go. <laughs> That's our new merch idea. We just sell. You buy a vinyl record and it comes with like one of those woolly bags, but it's uh, zipped up right. to be ready for a, a record. Oh, you're just pulling it out. And it's nice and cold from the woolly bag. It's like it's like vinyl served cold. Yes. <laughs> Music with a chill. I love it. <laughs> but I should let you go and feed that donkey. <laughs> it will only get worse from here. But uh, it sounds like you are continuing to have fun. Your audiences will definitely have fun when they see you in Roma and in Tamworth and elsewhere down the road. Michael Cook from Rusty Pickups. It's been delightful to talk to you. Thanks for your time. Always a pleasure, Sophie. Thank you so much.